So good morning. Um, we're moving north today, uh, but I think it's a, a really lovely period. Uh, as you know, being from the north, I'm a little biased, but I really love northern paintings. And today we're going to look at a phenomenon that happens in the 16th century in the north. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mute you. I'm using you all. There we are. And um, a phenomenon where artists are starting to really get a particular interest in nature. Uh, and we're going to see how, though they don't meet, they don't gather, it's not really a school, uh, but we see a simultaneous tendency, uh, particularly on the uh, Danube. Uh, the Danube Valley. So let's first look at that Danube school. As I say, it's more of a style than school. It runs pretty much from Regen Regensburg to the Hungarian border, uh, where a whole series of artists are going to work in the same perspective. Uh, for your information, Regensburg is uh, in at the, the southern uh, east part of uh, Germany. It was more or less launched by Lukas Cranach, who we will see um, uh, later on, though he never really belonged to that group. And we'll talk about Lukas Cranach when we talk about the Reformation. They, these artists distinguish themselves in the field of painting, particularly landscapes or landscape background, sculpture, architecture, and craft. Uh, we can see probably an influence by Mantegna. At that time, they were already uh, prints that were circulating and uh, that were showing some of uh, Mantegna's work and with some lovely landscape. Uh, they show quite an imagination and great freedom in the choice of themes and also in the way they execute, which is going to uh, contrast with what Dürer is going to do, though Dürer is also one of the uh, figures that might have influenced them uh, do have, having a very strong interest in nature. Just for your interest here is our two views of uh, the Danube, uh, one in Hungary, and you can see how rich and lush uh, that region is as well as uh, near Zebach in Germany down below. So this is what attracted uh, the artists at that time. And you have to realize there were far more uh, trees at that time than even now, very mature trees. And we'll see how it is reflected in their works. I bring back one of the timeline to give us an idea. So here we have Albrecht Dürer, who had the rather, not very short, but rather short uh, career because he died prematurely in 1528. Uh, part of uh, the group uh, are Albrecht Aldorfer and Wolf Huber. The others are extremely difficult to find works uh, from, but know that there are many more artists. And I bring in to uh, some interesting sculptor, Hans Leinberger, uh, who is also German and who is making some very interesting uh, sculpture. I bring in as just as works of reference, uh, Jacob, Jacopo Bellini, uh, who was the father of the other two, uh, Giovanni and um, his brother escapes me right now, and Mantegna, who both are going to be figures that are going to influence Dürer uh, when he goes to Venice and uh, is able to see some of their work. Uh, in the very north, in the Netherlands, uh, we have already seen the works of Hieronymus Bosch, who is also uh, interested in nature. And then, of course, um, Peter Bruegel, who we're going to see today, who is the epitome of uh, nature, people within nature, and with his extraordinary landscape, even though uh, most of them are fictional. So I wanted to bring back some works from uh, Albrecht Dürer uh, and some that are far less known. This one is rather known, the wire drawing mill. Uh, 
shows that uh, beautiful view not far from um, Nuremberg with the very typical, very steep uh, roof lines uh, around that region because it does snow in the winter. Uh, but sh that shows his immediate interest uh, in uh, landscapes, uh, cityscapes, if we can call it. Uh, but we see also his understanding of perspective. This was prior to uh, his first visit to, to Italy, but he is already showing something that is going to become a staple of uh, the Northern uh, landscape is, is that differentiation of colors with uh, the uh, horizon, horizon line, where you have what is called the atmospheric perspective with, uh, in contrast with the linear perspective. And it is true if you go out in a clear day and you look at the horizon, you're going to see how the colors are going to change when you look further away. Here are a few more of his landscape. This is adorable, the house by a pond, by a pond. Uh, that house is actually going to reuse in some of his paintings. This is, seems to be um, a house from which they could uh, check on what was happening uh, around. So it's set on an island, probably kind of a lookout uh, post and maybe a summer retreat uh, in peacetime where they could enjoy the, the coolness of the water. Pond in the woods, that dates from about the same period as the previous one. And we can see the very mature pine trees, very typical of the region. It's very spontaneous. It's why I like that watercolor. You cannot really be too formal when you do a watercolor. The willow mill, of course, he was very attracted by mill because this is where you could get some paper and uh, a lot of other uh, materials. He is also very interested in uh, animals and plants. So, uh, sorry, this is one more. The view of the Kaschenhoit. Kasch the Kalschhoit, sorry. Um, and again, these are pretty quickly uh, done type of works, but so we find that with many great artists that they, they had always uh, some pigments for watercolors and they were going around and doing some of these wonderful landscapes that they can integrate in their paintings later on. And here we come to some of his uh, beautiful animal. This is a lobster, beautifully done in a pen drawing on paper, directly related to it, a crab done in 1495. So this dates back when he was in Venice and would have been a, a live crab when he uh, painted it. The much more known Young Hare, which is probably one of my favorite works of all, uh, just the magnificent rendering of the texture of the, the hair of the hair. Um, his uh, fierce look, he doesn't look like a gentle little bunny, but uh, very much aware of uh, the difficulties of, of life. He might be very frightened at that time but it's extraordinary, these huge ears that are so uh, typical of the hair. And then nature, these are large uh, piece of turf, very typical of uh, what you could find in the Middle Age around that uh, area. So these are really botanical observation of uh, different uh, plants. And the marvelous shading of green to silver gray is just extraordinary. The 
the iris at that time uh, the iris was uh, only known in venice as far as western europe was concerned and so in doing so he probably had been inspired by some of the drawings by bellini jacopo bellini who had made these magnificent treatises of drawings as most painters actually had a series uh, mature painters would accumulate a series of sketches and so on that they would use in uh, many of their paintings. And more animals, the little owl. The beautiful wing of a roller with the incredible gradation of color shimmering color it's the way he he's able to give you that sense of black but with some blue undertone and the different greens is, is spectacular and then the famous rhinoceros he never saw a rhinoceros the first rhinoceros appeared in 15 15 in Portugal. And this drawing was made according to the description and a rough sketch from a friend of his who sent it to him to Nuremberg from Portugal. And this, interestingly enough, though it's full of mistakes as far as the, the rhinoceros is, uh, you know, that uh, he doesn't have that additional uh, horn on the back. They are, the way he looks like he's like he's really uh, wearing a body of armor is not correct. But for centuries, this drawing became the archetype of what a rhinoceros was. And then the walrus. Uh, he was always interested in uh, oddities of nature. And um, you can see how he really put the face of the walrus in the front of the, the picture is like looking at you. This, by the way, was used as a detail in a, one of the altar paintings uh, that he did with the Madonna and Child. I don't know how he introduced it. But uh, his comment on the side here says, that the animal which I have drawn this picture of was captured in the Dutch sea and was 12 cubits in size with four feet. So uh, he probably overheard of it, but we know that uh, in 21, he had gone to the north and actually um, even unfortunately caught malaria, which is going to pursue him until his death in 28. And then quite an interesting uh, piece that I joined because I think it's uh, uh, quite telling. It's a dream vision. And in the whole comment that he says there, uh, he explains that he had a dream in, in 1525 between the Wednesday and Thursday. He says uh, after a certain thing that he had that vision. And to the contrary of all the vision he had, he was able when he woke up to still see it. And he immediately put it on paper and painted it with that big uh, column of water that was on the side of that pond, a few buildings, and then these dramatic blue stripes coming from the sky. The advantage of these watercolors, as I say, is they're very spontaneous. These are nothing that I rehearsed, made a modello for, you know, he, he sees it and he, he paints it. I'm moving now to another medium, which is sculpture. And this time we talk about Hans Leinberger, who, of whom we know very, very little. We not, don't even know where he was born. We know around 1475. We know that he was a resident in Landshut, uh, in 1510 and worked for Louis X, Duke of Bavaria after 1516 and pro probably became the official court artist to the Duke. 
he did some uh, wonderful sculptures, very typical uh, German from that, that southern part of Germany. Uh, the Madonna is recognizable in painting or in sculpture uh, by that very uh, hefty profile. Here's the Rosenkranz Madonna carrying the scepter and then the child very mobile, which would have been an, uh, an influence from the Italian too. He was the most eminent sculptor in Bavaria in the second and third decade of the 16th century. But this is really something that interested me was the figure of death. We know that there are lots of memento mori at that time, but this is very unique. Huh? He shows the body in decay and in full action. Uh, so th these are three little statues made of, made of boxwood that are the Walter Art Museum. They date from um, rather still the beginning of his uh, career. You can see the Italian uh, influence in the contrapposto of the, the attitude of uh, these figures. I think they are absolutely fascinating. And then uh, the Holy Family, these are more typical of that period. So we see uh, St. Anne, the Virgin, and then Christ. And St. Eudoc, uh, St. Eudoc is uh, the same as um, St. Joyce, um, or in French, saint Jos. Very powerful figure. I think there is definitely an influence from the Donatello uh, sculpture. So he must have seen some uh, engravings of works by Italians. There is really that, that power that you find in the South, in Florence particularly. And then Christ uh, in Ellen, so he's Christ in Passion. It is really. Uh, thinking at the same time of what's happening to him. Coming back to uh, the Danube school, uh, we have some uh, interesting painter, Jörg Hoy the Elder. Unfortunately, a, a lot of his works have been, have disappeared. Uh, but I found just uh, these two that show that interest in nature and you can relate to what we'll see at the end with Peter Bruegel, but it's the uh, scene of the life of St. Bernard. Uh, St. Bernard, very important figure uh, in the monastic uh, movement. It shows how the uh, brethren are uh, working extremely hard. They were living from their, their work. Uh, but it, it's a really empathetic view of the saint. Uh, Jörg Breu uh, the Elder was also an engraver. He made um, some uh, stained glass windows and was also a um, miniaturist, made some illumination for manuscripts. He designed woodcuts and uh, is known to have made portraits, altarpieces, and battle scene. Unfortunately, his works are not easy to find. Another one here by him is the flight into Egypt. And you can see the great importance of the landscape in the background. Also the billowing cape of uh, Joseph there, who is kind of blessing Jesus, Mary looking at her son too while the soldiers behind there um, are going around the houses to massacre the elder son of each of the families under the order of Herod. The main figure of the Danube school is Albrecht Aldorfer, and this is a more known figure for you. And I think he's a wonderful artist. 
Uh, we know that he was active in Regensburg, which is almost at the border with Austria uh, in 1505. He was influenced by Cranach, Dürer, and Mantegna, was the guiding spirit of the Danube school. So again, these people never gathered, so it's difficult to say it's a school, it's more of a style, but this is the way it's named in places. He was really the first artist to show an interest in landscape as an independent genre. Uh, his, among his patrons, he counted Maximilian I, Louis X, and uh, Duke of Bavaria. Uh, he was from 1526 employed as the town architect of Regensburg. Unfortunately, most of what he did uh, has disappeared. Here is a view of uh, Regensburg, also known at that time as Hattisborn, as the typical German uh, city was surrounded by walls and by uh, rivers. They would really build it generally and uh, canalize the water so it would run around and be a protection of the city. We find uh, the, the interest in the, the whole um, landscape it comes from the very uh, beautiful uh, forests that uh, were uh, really making the landscape in the southern part of Germany. So you see all that brown place and Regensburg is in this area. So they really had that beautiful landscape around them. This is the roadmap of Central uh, Europe by uh, Erhard Erzlauber. And um, one of the early works by Albrecht Adolfer shows the landscape with Sater uh, and his family. And this comes uh, in contrast. I mean, they are obviously in a big uh, forest. Look at the size of these trunks. Uh, this goes back to the idea of the Greek uh, mythology, where you had these, uh, these satyrs who were the companion of Pan and Dionysus. They were described as hoggish but faint-hearted folk. They were subversive and dangerous, yet shy and cowardly. So we have here very much uh, the fascination with the realm of nature and the complexity of human nature when you see the family of the satyr has settled on a tree covered slope at the foot of a cliff. Uh, but uh, we have on the other side, we have a uh, man uh, with a woman who is coming there, seem to be uh, looking for the uh, satyr and his family to uh, harm them. So this really shows that kind of antithesis of the urban dweller, uh, uncivilized, but free of society's restriction. And you also had that uh, uninhibited way of life uh, where they would run around uh, in the nude. This corresponds to a time uh, of great nationalism in Germany who wanted to celebrate the beauty of its country. Uh, some books were written about Germania uh, by Konrad Celtis and um, that book really had quite an influence uh, on artists and writers of the time. The, the idea of the satyr was very much influenced by uh, Andrea Mantegna, here is the allegory of the fall of in ignorant humanity uh, that shows a whole series of people, including Sater playing the, the flute, uh, there where you have uh, a man here with ass uh, ears that leads that unsuspected woman to the edge of a pit, and she's both literally and morally blind. Uh, error is, sorry, is encouraged by a winged figure of a satyr here, 
with uh, bat's wings and bird's feet playing bagpipe and symbolizing lust. The uh, man with the sack over his head tied at the neck leads a, log, a dog uh, on a leash and this man feigns blindness and may well be fraud. To the right, we have ignorance, that fat-crowned woman sitting on a globe holding an, a rudder. The instable globe and rudder both represent fortune. Serving, the, serving their queen are ingratitude with blindfold and scarf, as you can see there, and avarice, greed, um, with dirty hair and large ears. So these were very much moralizing uh, uh, works by uh, Mantegna and that influenced a lot of people in the north. Other works by Adolfo show again that lushness of nature that was surrounding him with St. George and the dragon. And you, as you can see, the scene here of St. George and the dragon literally disappears within the trees where you can barely look at them, but your attraction, your eye is totally attracted by the, the beautiful trees. He also did uh, some uh, nice uh, watercolors. This is an etching that is uh, colored with watercolor. Uh, and this triggered a say by Michelangelo, in Flanders, they paint with a view to deceive central vision. They paint stuffs and masonry, the green grass of the fields, the shadow of the trees and rivers and bridges, which they call landscape. Now I do understand that this was quite a demeaning say by Michelangelo, who had very little respect for Northern painters. And the beautiful tree in the foreground is, is superb. It reminds me of something we'll see in the 17th century with a, a great um, Dutch printer. Etcher, I should say. In, he's using, as I mentioned often, he's using nature as a background. Uh, and then next to it, you have wonderful stories. This is the stories of Susanna in the bass and the stoning of the elders, uh, where you see here Susanna having her bass and then hidden under the trees are the elders who of course are going to blackmail her to try to get her to give her some privileges uh, in pretending that she was having an affair with somebody. We know the story and they interrogated separately they both, the, the men uh, cannot identify the tree under which they were. And so they, they were proved uh, lying and they were stoned. But it's extraordinary work. We see right away the influence of the uh, Italian Renaissance uh, with that superb palace, uh, very much uh, inspired by also some of the, the works by Bellini the architectural works of Berlin. An interesting work is this one, the Battle of Alexander and Darius at Issus. This was commissioned by Willem IV of Bavaria, uh, part of a cycle of eight paintings of ancient heroes and uh, another set of eight with heroines. Uh, these were created between 1528 and 1540 by a team of German artists, including Borkmeier, Bartel Behan, Jörg Brauer the Elder, uh, and uh, Aldorfer. Uh, not a super large painting when you see it, 62 by 47 inches. Uh, and when you see the crowd that is involved in it, it really looks small when you see the real painting because it's so overcrowded. The subject here is the victory of the young Alexander the Great in 333 over the Persian army of King Darius in the Battle of Issus. And uh, you really need to see a, a blow up of the place to identify the works. And so here you can see Alexander recognizable because he has Western 
body of armor and he's followed by Western knights, of course, in the much more contemporary uh, attire than um, it existed in, in real, as you, you can guess. These look very much like German knights and Landsknecht, uh, who were the mercenary foot soldiers. Now coming from the other side, you see a whole crowd with turbans. And of course, this is far more reminiscent of the Turks than what would have been with Darius at that time. Now, what is also interesting, and we, we know we're dealing with Althorfers, it's looking at the landscape. What we see here is totally out of place to this represents the Mediterranean and the cross from uh, the northern part of, uh, of Europe, we looking at the delta of the Nile River in Egypt. Also admire that you have the moon on one side and the sun on the other. The moon, of course, being part of the crescent of uh, the uh, Muslim forces. So we have an identification of uh, Darius being part from the east and it's superimposed by the Turks versus Alexander who is still for us in the east because he's uh, in um, the um, sorry Turkish uh, body at that time and but he's represented as a westerner It's a fascinating painting. And of course, as I mentioned, Darius is in fact representing, uh, represented by Suleiman the Magnificent who had attacked uh, Vienna in 1529. Other works by Adolfer, some uh, very nice etchings. This is the landscape of the city by the lake. And then religious painting like uh, Sebastian, St. Sebastian altar. But again, as you can see the integration of the landscape in the back, which is uh, pretty new um, in the North. Or the crucifixion showing the Virgin, of course, uh, and, and St. John, but on a backdrop of a magnificent landscape, rocky landscape with even some uh, water, which would be very different to what we had uh, traditionally seen. And of course the two donors at the foot of the, the cross. And the Jewish uh, star, which is unusual because you would normally see Adam's skull there. Christ taking leave of his mother. We have uh, Mary collapsing in the arms of uh, some other women with unusually large feet. And then uh, Jesus, uh, Befi there uh, explaining that he is uh, leaving. But again, we have the dominance of nature and architecture uh, all around and the tiny, tiny donor and his family. In his resurrection of 1518, we find something that is very um, similar to what we had seen in the Isenheim uh, altarpiece, uh, that these very strange uh, yellow, orange and red colors uh, that are becoming very much a staple of uh, German art at that time. But again, uh, predominance of nature on top of that um, figure of Jesus coming out of the, the tomb. Another artist from the same school, lesser known by far than uh, Aldorfer, uh, is Wolf Huber, was born in Feldkirch for Halberg. Uh, this is in Austria in 1485, worked in a family workshop, visited Northern Italy 
and then lived in Passau uh, in 1515, became the court painter to Anne's Duke of Bavaria and died in his manor house in Passau, became uh, very close to the Duke. And just for you information, this is the kind of uh, a place he was uh, living in. So to give you again an idea of the nature, the beauty of nature by which he was surrounded. So this is uh, Feldkirch and this is Passau. Just a few works because again, he's not as well known and uh, probably because of that, a, a lot of his work has disappeared, wasn't cared for as well. Uh, here is the morning of Christ. As you can see, there is a definitely an Italian influence in the figure of Christ. Uh, but then the majestic landscape in the back. And then similar, it's the allegory of salvation uh, here where you see Christ uh, hanging at the cross with God the Father uh, looking at him from a cloud. Then very much a large uh, architectural architectural uh, device here in the very middle that could have been influenced by Perugino uh, or Raphael himself. And then the crowd, very colorful cloud, very typical uh, German uh, color scheme with these green that go back to uh, Lochner in Cologne, but then orange and red, uh, it's much more colorful than what you find in other northern painters. And then a whole cityscape uh, around and a landscape at the back. He also did some beautiful um, pen drawings. This is the Danube landscape around Krems. Uh, and sorry, let me go back to there. Yeah, that's it. And this is pretty similar to another artist that is also part of that Danish school, this Augustin Hirschvogel, uh, the castle. We don't know much about him. Uh, he was a glass painter, etcher, cartographer, and mathematician, part of a family of uh, artists. They were in Nuremberg, the leading stained glass painter during the late 15th century. But unfortunately, with the arrival of the Reformation, um, his art of stained glass disappeared from the uh, reformed place in Germany. So he had to uh, go back just to painting and uh, drawing. This is another, the Imperial Abbey Church of Salem. Or the, another landscape in, involving castles and mills and others. This shouldn't surprise us because we already see quite an interest in nature uh, earlier in Europe. Uh, in the beginning of the 15th century, if you remember, we have the magnificent uh, Trériseur du Duc de Berry, that uh, book of ours that was illustrated in great part by the Limburg brothers. And where we see for the first time a whole series of landscape uh, far more important than the figures that are in the foreground. Where here we see peasants uh, going uh, for their work. This is the month of July, uh, illustrated by the time of the beginning of the harvest. And then when we have landscape, uh, we have uh, shepherds on the other side taking care of their flock. In the north, also the detail of the particular, that, that uh, delight for the particular, we had seen it with Ugo van der Goes, the uh, Adoration of Christ, otherwise known as the Fortinari altarpiece, that if you remember was done 
for a chapel in Florence by a Flemish artist. And in the very foreground of that beautiful piece was that lovely still life showing uh, flowers that are assimilated to the passion of Christ, the iris and the lilies and the columbines, all uh, having symbolic uh, relating to the passion of Christ. And we find in these beautiful manuscripts, uh, this is by Alexander Benning, uh, Antwerp artist, uh, who decorates, uh, frames uh, many of his religious scenes with magnificent uh, flowers done in absolutely perfect botanical, uh, with a botanical precision. In the six, early 16th century, we also see uh, works by Peter Artson and his nephew, uh, both are showing uh, a lot of still lives. And then often in, in the cameo in the background, we have a religious scene that seemed to be only um, kind of taking a second, second uh, level importance, uh, definitely uh, surpassed by the, the details of uh, what is happening in the front. And this is going to be an interesting uh, work that an, a spirit, if you want, almost like a philosophy that you see these little scenes in the background that in fact supposed to be more important, but it's the, the, the head of, the, of the, the, the oxen and the all that meat and the sausage that really attract our attention. Even in the depiction of maps, we see something that is very, uh, very much attached to nature. This is an interesting uh, map by Zebal Behan of the Turkish siege of Vienna in 1530, where you see in the very middle, the Stefan's Dome, the Cathedral of Vienna. Uh, but then an interesting uh, description, uh, supposedly, the artist saw it from the top of the steeple of the cathedral that he was able to uh, describe the countryside around Vienna and how uh, the, the Vienna was besieged. You have all the, the tents of the, the troops on one side, uh, of course, uh, Suleiman, and on the other side, uh, the troops, uh, the Viennese troops that are fortunately going to push back the invaders. And the works uh, also early 16th century by Joachim Patenier, who is originally from the southern part of Belgium uh, and then went to work in Antwerp. Um, Antwerp that of course benefited from uh, a really great economy, uh, great economy. And so was attracting artists at that time. And you always see, you see some scenes, religious scenes, often either by the way painted by other uh, artist, Quentin Metzes is one of them. And, uh, uh, but again, the uh, preeminence of the landscape that is really attracting us. And here we see uh, a landscape with Charon and the man's soul. He's moving towards hell. And here we have on the other side, uh, a garden with angels. And of course, the uh, heavenly Jerusalem. This is the Styx River. Cerberus, the, the dog with, who, who was guarding uh, the mouth of hell. So before we move into Brogol, I think I'm gonna take a break so that we can go on with uh, Brogol. And if you want to uh, unmute yourself, you feel free to do so. If you have any question, just go for it. Um, Anne, I'm, I'm very curious about paintings like the meat seller's stall. <clears throat> A lot of painters painted like these dead animals that are skinned and hung up for meat. Why, why would someone, number one, want to paint it? I mean, they did a great job, but why would they want to paint that? And why would someone buy it? 
representing the fact that at that time the economy was pretty good. It was the world of plenty, the world of plenty. And so uh, this was a genre very particular to arts and, and um, Bucalar, who was his uh, nephew. They were very known for these pieces. And it's not always meat, it can be fruits and vegetables. It depends on, on uh, what they want to do, but they were very known for them. But, but who would want to hang that in their, in their, in their house? I mean, oh, you could practically see the look of it. more sensitive to that than they were. <laughs> we, have become, we have become, be careful, we see you, Mrs. Malander, be careful. But you can practically <laughs> smell it. You know, when it's hanging in your house, wouldn't you, wouldn't you like think of the smell every time you walked by it? Yes, but uh, we have to realize for them, it was meat. You know, people were often killing the, 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 the animal in front of other people. So um, it's, we, we have to realize how we have become very sensitive. We becoming city dwellers. If you talk to people in the countryside, uh, that have a farm or whatever, this wouldn't shock them at all. Even though they have that head too? I mean, they made a point of, of showing the, 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 the severed no, head. The head. The head was eaten. Huh? Everything in the head was eaten. Uh -huh. It was a delicacy. <laughs> it was in many countries. You know, if you scrub, the, the tongue of, of an ox is, is a delicacy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, it, this is an interesting comment because if you go to France today on a weekend, the fairs in the uh, trade uh, uh, show, fairs, you see the animals. And I was amazed to see a head of a pig slice it in half. And I said, what is this doing here? No, they were selling by uh, 100 grams through 200 grams. I was, I was shocked, but I guess it is. Oh, cuts. Then it's called a tête pressée, which means a pressed head. And they take all kinds of the part of the head of the animal, and then they cook it, and then they press it together, and it becomes just like a ham, and you cut it, tête pressée. So we are very finicky in the US, believe me, compared to what you find in the US, in Europe, because they've had that habit from a long time, nothing is wasted. In Cuba, we saw, um, by the side of our bus, there were people butchering a pig. Yeah. But, I mean, it's one thing to, to, to have that, and it's another thing to make a painting of it. I mean, the, the work that goes into that painting, you know, the work that goes into it. And then mind, Cynthia, you have to remember, we have become ultra sensitive to that. Yeah. And at that time, that was just the proof that the country was rich. And they thought that was beautiful. Yeah. Why not? It was, you know, that was going to be transformed into good food. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I just... <laughs> I love the comment. I think it's very good because it, it, it shows us how much we have changed. Yeah. And uh, as I say, I always laugh because sometimes there are things that uh, I really like that I can find in Europe that I would never find here. One of the things, for example, is brain. Brain is excellent. It's really <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I but I don't share that. <laughs> Look, it, it's so fine. It's so good. But I, I know when you hear and you talk about it, is all oh, people faint just at the idea. <laughs> I mean, I eat all kinds of things that I wouldn't want to have hanging on my wall in a picture, you know? No, but <laughs> yeah, I, I understand because our point of view has changed so much. But at that time, I mean, they were very, very famous and quite expensive. I know. Yeah. yeah. Any other of them? Before we go on with Peter Brokel? So I'm going to mute you again, and uh, we'll go. I'll unmute you. No, you will unmute yourself at the end of the of the the class. So mute you all. There you are. And we're going to go on.
No, with Peter Bruegel. And I have to admit, I'm very biased. I adore Peter Bruegel, though I think a lot of people do too. Unfortunately, because in, in Europe, so much of, and in Belgium in particular, so much of the archives have been lost or burned during wars. So we don't have much information on him for his early life. There are debates where he was born. Uh, a lot of people now believe that he was born around Breda, which is at the border of the Netherlands and Belgium, around 1525. This is kind of a, a calculation that's made um, according to when he was an apprentice to Peter Cook. So he was apprenticed for five years with uh, Peter Cook Van Aals in uh, Antwerp between 1545 and 50, uh, so between the age of 20 to 25, and uh, became a free master at the Painters Guild in Antwerp. By the way, Peter Cook Van Aals was a very famous artist that get tremendous, had quite a large workshop and produced a lot of um, triptychs and, and religious painting. In uh, between 51 and 52, he traveled to Italy and quite a way into Italy. He went all the way to Palermo because we know of a painting he did of a city that was burning following an invasion by the Turks. Uh, so this is a, a long trip at that time. He met Giulio Clovio, uh, who's, who was a very uh, celebrated miniaturist and worked with him in 1553. Uh, came back and settled in Antwerp between 1555 and 63, where he worked for Hieronymus Koch, who was an engraver, very famous. He was the best engraver in the area. I'm not talking on the Antwerp, but the whole of the Netherlands and Northern Germany. And uh, was publishing an enormous amount of prints. And this is where uh, Hogel is going to contribute a lot with uh, some of his marvelous prints. And he married in 1563 uh, Cook's daughter, who is Maikam. And, and moved to Brussels. There's an interesting story. Apparently, uh, Bruegel had kind of an affair with a maid who was working for him. And it's uh, um, Cook's wife who pushed um, Bruegel to move to Brussels uh, to put a distance between the maid and him uh, while she, he was just married with a uh, make and uh, Cook. Uh, briefly after that, they will have uh, two sons, Peter, who was uh, born in 1564, and Jan in 1568. And unfortunately, shortly after, in 1569, he died in Brussels. We're not sure of what, uh, and is buried in Notre Dame de la Chapelle Church in the center of the old Brussels. Uh, a lovely church, by the way. I go very often there. Uh, the as uh, the uh, Rubens was a friend of Jan Bruegel, in particular, the son of Peter Bruegel. Rubens painted the painting, which is uh, in the little chapel where Bruegel is buried, and so it, it's a great place. He spelled his name Bruegel until 1559, so that came later in his life and the, his sons retained that age. And so when you see the different uh, spelling, uh, it is, we always uh, spell Peter Bruegel the way you see on the top with B-R-U-E-G-E-L. And sons have an H after the G. Uh, so this, uh, when you see Peter Bruegel the younger, it will have an H uh, within. He is, uh, he is, during his trip to Italy, he was supposed to have made an, an enormous amount of uh, uh, mountain uh, landscape pen and uh, brown ink uh, drawings. And these are magnificent. Unfortunately, recently, uh, some very credible scholars have come up with the fact that these were not made by him. So I only show you one because I love them, but apparently it is not made by Peter Bruegel. 
as many uh, painters of the time, if they were surviving long enough, uh, Brogo has had a, an, an amazing dynasty. And then why it's different to many others is that most of the figures in his uh, dynasty were successful painters. So I wanted to show you this. So we have Peter Brogo, we don't know who his family was, married American Cooker, uh, with whom he had actually three children. Peter Brogel, who was born uh, in 64, 68, we have Jan Brogel and Maria, we don't have it, even a date. She's just a girl, so as you know. Uh, Peter Brogel uh, became a painter and mostly painted uh, works that were very similar to his father because they were so successful. He copied a lot of them. He's often called Peter Brogel a uh, help Hellbrogel, uh, because he was attributed many paintings that decrypted and uh, described uh, hell. But in fact, they now realize that mostly it is these were painted by his brother Jan. So anyway, uh, that's uh, Peter Brogel, very successful, painted uh, a lot of works, as I say, very similar to his uh, father, had many children as you can see, including one who became a painter, Peter the Three, uh, less known, uh, but uh, was recognized. Jan Brogel, uh, the, uh, the, the elder, uh, was a super uh, successful painter, did like his father went to Italy, stayed more or less in the north, particularly in Milan and became uh, very quickly appreciated there, particularly uh, by the, uh, some of the uh, religious notorieties there. Uh, his works are very known for, he did a lot of still lives, a lot of flower still lives that were extraordinary. And uh, so he, uh, he was known also as a velvet brogel because of the beautiful handling of the brush. He married twice because of the death of his first wife. First, Isabella de Jode, who died in 1603, and then Katharina van Marienburg. And so had a whole series of kids, as you can see, including with his first wife, Jan Rogel the Younger, who is going to become a very successful uh, painter and painted a lot uh, first in the, his father's studio, uh, but um, again, they followed pretty much the style of his father. His sister, Passaz, Pascasia, married Hendrik van Kessel, uh, who was a painter and who was also very known. And uh, Pascasia and Hendrik had a son, Jan van Kessel, who is a very known painter. Uh, so again, there we have a pretty good uh, dynasty. Jan Brogel, uh, the younger, had uh, many children, including two, Abraham and Ambrosius, who also became painters, mostly went to Italy and became known in, in Italy. Through Katharina van Marienburg, Jan Brogel had three children, two daughters and one son. Ambrosius also became a painter. Uh, and went also to the south. Anna, the daughter, married David Tanis the younger, and they had the child, David, David Tanis uh, the third, uh, both extremely uh, known, ex um, more David Tanis the younger than uh, anything else. But this is a really interesting dynasty. It's rare to see such a, a complete success uh, in the descendants. And uh, the interest for people to remain within the profession was that they would inherit the tools and the, and the client base, the custom base, and so on. So to coming back to Peter Brogel, let's look at some of his very early um, uh, engravings. These are uh, etchings, actually. This one, they often quite caricatural. These were very uh, moralizing works. So this, you have the ass in the school. And here you can see the ass who is uh, in the barn, but with a, a page 
in front of him trying to, to learn. So in the Netherlands, what you had a rather high level of education. And so an Italian traveler ventured uh, the opinion that everyone could read and write, which is not true. But here you see Brogo laughing at his countrymen's eagerness to learn. And the caption comments that an ass will never become a horse, even if he goes to school. So these were some of the proverbs that you could find in the country. And you see, it's adorable because you can see the kids, uh, girls and boys, by the way, uh, but going around and, and uh, learning and then some, of course, uh, mischievous uh, doing things they were not supposed to. This one is in the basket and the master is punishing one who has behaved properly. Another one that is uh, also part of a, a proverb, big fishes eat little fishes, uh, shows uh, whales. They often, you on the coast of uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, you would find sometimes some uh, whales that would uh, just uh, be caught by, by the, uh, the tide. And, there you see right away, it doesn't look like a whale, by the way, but you see how you have the, the opening the whale and you have all these fish falling and from the fish fall other fishes. And so that's the whole idea, of course, of society uh, where the, the high level people uh, have very little compassion for the smaller people and then eat and that goes on and on to the very top. One of the early paintings that has been um, attributed to Bruegel, it's not signed, but it's definitely his style. And whoever painted it made, I think, a magnificent work. This is the landscape with the fall of Icarus. Um, absolutely beautiful work that is in Brussels, by the way, at the Musée Royal des Beaux-Arts. Uh, so this is soon after he came back from Italy and there you can see how he's reproducing some of the landscape he saw over there that not, do not belong to Belgium at all, I can tell you. But the just beautiful landscape with the, the ships just going through the sea and we all wondering where is Icarus? And in fact, Icarus, you really have to look at the painting to see Icarus who has fallen from the sky. Of course, you know the story where uh, Icarus is with his father Daedalus left, fled from uh, Crete, uh, thanks to the wings that uh, Daedalus had invented. But uh, Icarus, who was a young and uh, brushed type of guy, decided he wanted to fly closer to the sun. But the, the uh, wings were covered with wax and of course the wax melt down as soon as he was too high and he fell down into the, the sea. And so here is the only thing that we see of Icarus is just two legs and a hand coming out of the, the sea with a fisherman on the side who doesn't even notice what is happening. Nor does the bird, by the way, who's perched on the tree. Oh, sorry. Um, what is very interesting, and it, it has puzzled a lot of people, is uh, to see on that painting with a high viewpoint, but see how the, the man here is just pursuing his work very uh, and, and, and um, how can I say? Not at all concerned by what's happening around. He doesn't know. The, the, a shepherd there, uh, neither. Maybe he's looking at Daedalus, who is going on his flight. Uh, we don't know. And there is a figure also hidden there, and we cannot find the meaning for that pe person who is hidden in the bushes. It's actually could be a corpse or, or just a man hiding. So there, there is a proverb who says, no plow stops because the man dies. And that could be a part of the, the, these proverbs. We know 
that Bruegel loved to include these proverbs in his works, his moralizing side. But this is an absolutely delightful painting. Part of the proverb is this lesser known painting that you can find in the, the former house of the mayor uh, Vandenberg in Antwerp. It's a beautiful uh, old house with uh, rather a good collection of lesser known paintings, but quite good though. So if you go through Antwerp, don't forget to visit that. It's really interesting because of the color scheme. You have that kind of black background and then these red medallion. And e each of them, you have a figure that represents a proverb. So, uh, not too many paintings, um, na naval paintings, but this one was done in the Gulf of Naples. So obviously we know this was a memory of um, what uh, Bruegel had done uh, during his trip uh, to Naples. You can really well recognize the Bay of Naples with a big castle on the side and what was at that time uh, not a very, very large city. And of course, the erupting volcano on the side, the Vesuvio there. Um, it's a naval battle. Trying to see if they had an idea of... But we're not sure exactly which one it is. Uh, among the, the works that uh, Bruegel did at that time, so the end of the 50s, he did a whole series of group paintings where you have a whole series of people. This is the Netherlandish proverb, and you can probably pass about two hours in front of it and try to identify uh, each of the proverbs that are shown. By the way, the study of proverbs is called paraneology. Uh, and this can be dated back as far as Aristotle, by the way. So in all these metaphors, you can, you can see uh, it, it's really interesting and I'm not gonna go into it. I'll give you a link to a site where you can uh, go uh, and, and identify each of them. Here you have, of course, in the very center, the young woman who is marrying an old guy and of course that's making fun of the old guy thinking that he that she's doing it just for love uh, but you have uh, here people sending roses throwing roses at swans all these have uh, a lot of, of meaning so I'll give you the side because this is uh, really interesting but every single figure that you see here has a meaning you have people here throwing uh, some uh, pancakes, another guy who's defecating from the window. All these, as I say, have something to, to say. It's a fascinating work. This was quite fashionable at the time. We find here uh, by Niccolo Nelli in Venice uh, in 64, doing the same, having all these figures, but I think they're being separated like this are less interesting than the that um, amalgam of figures that uh, Bruegel presents. Or oh, this one, this is a, by another Dutch uh, man, uh, Franz Ogenberg, the blue cloak and the folly. So here you have again the same idea of the old man and the young bride, the folly of the world. Part of that series, uh, you know, so here is again uh, the, the work. So here you have a, I'm trying to find because you really have to locate them. Uh, there is a well somewhere. <coughs> and he blocks up the well after the calf is drowned. So uh, this is the, the calf is already uh, drowned, but he's now finally. Uh, filling the well and it's too late or one shares the sheep another the pig 
here. You have here uh, the ID, you don't share a pig. So some have all the advantages, other none. As I say, throwing roses to the swan, uh, waste, uh, yeah, uh, it, which is um, waste the effort on the unworthy. So again, all these, and I, I'll give you the link, is quite interesting. Here is the central figure of uh, the woman with the, the blue, the, the husband. Uh, so this is the man, how, how do they say, I'm sorry, but I, I can't. Um, okay, when a woman hangs a blue coat on her husband, that is cuckolds him. So that's the idea, if she does, that means she's having an affair. So these are really the, the marvelous and interesting uh, views of Bruegel, who had, must have had a tremendous sense of humor. One of the other uh, wonderful works of that time is the fight between Carnival and Lent. These again are uh, a whole series of uh, little uh, cameos that you can observe and they all have different meanings. And so you have Lent here, which is that very thin figure uh, where you cannot eat as you know, any fat and, and so on. But uh, opposed to, to her is a carnival, who is of course, it's the last day before Lent where you can eat and do what you want. And this would be the traditional annual carnival that was held in Flemish towns and villages a week before Lent. This would be an excuse, of course, for excessive drinking and sex. And keep in mind that little series here that shows uh, people on crutches, these are people uh, that were handicapped <coughs> or maimed. And it shows that these were part of the life of the village. They were always a series of crippled people uh, there at that time. And how they interact with the, the village is also quite interesting. We'll see it again later. Very cute is the children's game. Uh, this picture shows 200 children and 80 different games. Uh, what we have to realize when this was done, it, Burgo was known to go in circles of uh, humanists. And so they would, even if he wasn't highly educated, he couldn't read Latin, for example, uh, but uh, he knew about the ideas of the time. And so childhood at that time was not viewed as a phase of life with any requirements of its own, but merely as a preliminary stage to adulthood. So children were actually treated as little adults, as you can see by the way they are dressed. So the little girls uh, would have the apron and the bonnets of their mother, while the boys had trousers, jerkins, and jacket that looked very much like their fathers. And there are hardly any toys uh, there except for uh, hobby horse and dolls and windmills or uh, on long sticks. Uh, but most of the children are managing without toys, are making do with pig's bladder, knuckle bone, and caps, and so on. So you can see all kinds of games. These are with the, the Cerso. Then you have the lovely procession where they pretend to be uh, taking a child to baptism. And here's a doll carried by the first one. And they all dressed like their mother. Uh, they play. Um, hobby horse and here on the fence. I mean, again, these are really conversation piece. 
I envy people that own these paintings because you could really have a great time looking at it. Uh, very different is, and almost similar to Andorfer in some ways, you have here the suicide of Saul, represent the subject, it's very rarely shown by the way, but shows the suicide of Saul here on the left, the only place where you can identify after his defeat by the Philistine. And these are described in Samuel 31, 1 to 5. You see that extraordinary landscape with the dark colors and some fire uh, at, the, at the end. But the, the entire army that's coming back defeated. The Triumph of Death is a more sinister uh, painting. where you see, of course, uh, death and, and all these skeletons uh, coming and then uh, throwing bodies over the, uh, the edge of, of the, that building. Uh, and here you have death taking all these skeletons in a, a cart. And a whole, again, a whole a series of cameos. You have dogs coming here and eating things. You have a, an emperor uh, with his body of armors who is dead. Uh, you have some monks and all kind of figures and always this surrounding the, the place. This is much closer to Bosch. And then you have these terrible scenes of the gallows uh, in the background and people hanging or being uh, exposed on these wheels, which was pretty bad here, man is decapitated. It's a rather uh, difficult painting to look at. In Delevite, which is uh, in English, Mad Meg. I'm sorry, but this one I have to take. Hello? Yeah, for whatever reason, it doesn't seem. Uh, this is a painting that was uh, pretty known. It shows uh, that a very large... Lo Uh, shows that very large figure of the Lecrit, which is that long, ugly uh, image. Uh, showing uh, probably madness. And that was a vice that uh, included insanity. I'm so sorry, but this is the clinic calling me. So, hello? Yeah, can you call me back later? I'm giving a class right now. I'm giving a class right now. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, so the, this is the, that whole idea of madness and all you see around uh, here are figures again, very similar to uh, Hieronymus Bosch, these eggs and all these vessels and a, a huge head here that becomes part of the landscape with people coming out of his uh, mouth. Uh, so madness was at that time including insanity, rage, gluttony, lust, avarice, and ambition. And so uh, we look at the idea of uh, Delacry as a representation of uh, folly. So a whole series of, of figures, you can see ships that are out of the water, some uh, kind of bubbles. And then here we have a big fire, uh, people falling from the rocks and uh, armies that are coming. This is the folly of the world. 
And the fall of the rebel angels uh, painted in uh, 62, where here we have the, again, the tradition of uh, Hieronymus Bosch's world with an incredible uh, array of people of all shapes. You have the Archangel Michael here with some other angels and they're pursuing these other angels that had uh, challenged God and they mix up with these, um, all these monsters that have wings of butterflies and uh, very strange uh, creatures. Much uh, sweeter is probably these two chained monkeys with a beautiful landscape in the background. Uh, monkeys were uh, becoming uh, quite a fad. Often people had them as pets. It's sad to see them chained though. Uh, but um, you can see how well um, Bruegel describes them very scientifically. There's, Bruegel shows an incredible variety of works. It's what I really like with him. Some of these uh, extraordinary images are the, he, he painted three towers of Babel. Uh, this is the largest one that is at the Kunsthistorisches Museum Vienna. And by the way, I will send you a view of the Bruegel's room. There is one room dedicated to Peter Bruegel, the elder, and there are three paintings by his sons also there. It's a very large room that is kept at temperature and humidity because all these paintings are on oak panel with a couple of exceptions and so very sensitive to the change of hygrometry or temperature. And so this is for sure one of the big treasures of the Kunsthistorisches. Uh, if any, the best excuse to go and see that in Vienna. And so you can see the, the, the extraordinary Tower of Babel being built. And again, you can look at it in details. Uh, with, uh, you have the train and, and all the ways buildings and churches were built at the time. It, it's quite an interesting uh, work to look at. This is placed on the coastal landscape. And on the, the side is the, the king that is ordered it to be built. I'm so sorry for the interruptions, but it looks like it is the day. <laughs> really beautiful. The other one that I'm showing you is, oh, here's a detail. It shows you to what incredible precision Rogan is going to, to describe the, the little a town that is next to the Tower of Babel with the very Flemish houses and the canals and the little uh, bridges. It's uh, just a beauty. By the way, I have the, I have the uh, puzzle to make it and I've never made it up to now. It's I think 3,500 pieces, too big. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Cynthia, yes, please, thank you. Um, so this is the small Tower of Babel that is in Rotterdam at the Museum Boymans van Bernigen. Not quite as interesting as the other one. Another of the religious uh, works that he did, they didn't do too many, but this is the procession to Calvary. And interesting because again, you have an incredible array of people doing all kinds of things. Again, you can really look at them and try to understand what is their contribution to what's happening. They are moving ahead and you barely, barely see where Christ is in that whole process uh, on his way to Calvary. There is even a windmill uh, there in the very top. And uh, I'm trying to, to see so, Oh, Christ is here in the very center and he has fallen. Uh, that's the time where he's going to be helped uh, by Simon uh, Siren to, to go on. But the, the preeminence is given to a, a group of people where we have here 
John and Mary, very much in the style of Van der Weyden, which is uh, quite interesting. And then some of the other Marys around uh, that are uh, just trying to attend to Mary, who is close to, to faint. Talking about Mary, this is a, a, an oil and panel that is done in Grisaille by Brogo, the death of the Virgin. In fact, it's the domission of the Virgin. She's close to dying. You have in front of her a crucifix on the pillow, which would have been the way uh, people would die. They often would prop up a crucifix in front so that they had the last vision of Christ on the cross before dying. And you have the apostles and uh, other Marys attending to her. She's holding a candle in her hand. And then there is a fireplace on the side trying to keep people warm. It's, it's a, such a beautiful, you have two little candles, a few points of uh, light here. Uh, but the light that emanates from her at the back is really what uh, gives the uh, attention to, to the, the work. Another grisaille is the Christ and the woman in, um, taken in adultery. So a woman uh, who the Pharisees have accused to have been, um, have been yeah, the, the woman has been accused of adultery. And so uh, this is one of the, the rare images of where you see a woman, not as a country woman, but more of an uh, urban ideal of beauty. Uh, and then you have the Pharisees there, they know, and Christ is telling them that the first that hasn't sinned uh, throws the first stone. And you can see the stone is on the ground. It's an extraordinary image of Christ uh, leaning down. Sometimes these grisai are more telling than uh, color images because it really pulls you to the figures more than uh, when you have tons of colors, just like in photograph. Coming to probably some of the most known works of Bruegel uh, are the series um, on the labor of uh, the, the labor of the months. Uh, we have still existing five of these that are disseminated in different uh, museums. Uh, we don't know if there were six of them originally or if there were 12 of them. Typically, there would be 12, uh, but it would be surprising that we lost seven of them. So anyway, in the meantime, we're going to look at what we have. And this is a, a drawing by Brogel of spring and probably could be the way, uh, the missing one that, that we have no trace of. Uh, would have looked like, and this would have been a preparatory work showing the spring and in fact people working on uh, the garden uh, in attending and then you have the shepherds attending their flock at the back and the whole town kind of coming to life, people uh, refinishing the roofs of these uh, galleries. So we only have uh, five that remain. We have the uh, hunters in the snow, we'll see that represents January, the gloomy day, February, haymaking, July, corn harvest, August, and the return of the herd uh, in November. So this one, which is at the National Gallery in Prague, uh, represents July and uh, gives us uh, that wonderful portrayal of what's happening in July. You have three young ladies that are uh, walking uh, very uh, lightly and with joy uh, towards the work, or they come back from work. You have other people carrying back some uh, fruits and uh, in these big baskets, somebody's on the horse pulling a little cart with uh, different fruits. Uh, somebody is sharpening the, the saw. And then here, the magnificent view here, and I'm going to enlarge it, showing the way Brogel paints and how he observes really well what he does, showing the difference of color of the hay 
once it's raised because it has started rotting and the, the great bluish color on the surface. And the beauty, even in the very much the background, you see here how in the village they're all celebrating. And so uh, this could be uh, a celebration for adults. It could be some children playing Tucker. In the Met, uh, we have the chance of having the corn harvest. And of course, when we talk about corn, we, meet, we mean wheat. Uh, this was a general term uh, at that time. They didn't have the corn yet as it comes from the new world. But the magnificence of the fields at that time, and it's hot, it's August. And so people are taking the shadow of the tree, resting between uh, two periods of the day, they're taking advantage to eat the food that the women have brought. They have their large hat to protect them from the sun. In the backdrop, as you can see, we have a kind of a haze and that explained, of course, by the heat. And here we can see that that scene. And again, there we have we don't have a very descriptive, uh, good description of the figures. The, the general uh, people they they're more interesting for their what they're doing than for who they are. And then here's a scene of children playing and people going around. And you have the, some of the, the oxen and the, the cows and so on on the side. The return of the herd is also at the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. I will give you a, uh, a link to, by the way, there is a uh, 3D system now where you can uh, see that whole room with an explanation for each of the paintings. The return of the herd in November, uh, completely different palette with uh, all mostly uh, ochres, uh, very much of a diagonal uh, movement. And the, the herd is going from the freedom of the pasture to the stables now, of course, for the winter. The village is still based in, in the sun, but the trees have lost their leaves. The vines are being trimmed and the old vine shoots are harvested. This, by the way, smells so good in the fire. They, are, they have put nets up on the side and you can see them on the side to catch the migrating birds. And then you have on the other side of the river also some gallows uh, with men uh, still hanging. And this would have been very typical. Uh, once they had, uh, they hung somebody, they would let him there literally until he rots because this was uh, just an example for people who uh, would not behave. So yeah, that's and here are the here are the gallows. Probably my very favorite is also at the Constitutions is the hunters in the snow that represents January. And where the figures are very much at the front. They are not the important thing. It's that whole landscape, which is extraordinary. And again, we have to realize that uh, where Bruegel was living, it's the flat land, as they say. It's the flat land. There is no cliff. There is no mountain. So this is all something that he brought back from his trips and that he integrates 
into the landscape as he did for the previous ones. Um, the scene of the village is so beautiful with the frozen ponds, uh, people walking on the snow, playing on, on the, the ice. And then you have these hunters that come back uh, with their dog and all they have is one rabbit for their whole work. At the inn that is indicated by that uh, little um, hanging uh, plate, uh, you have uh, people are forcing the fire so that they can uh, do some uh, cooking outside. Just let me show you that's uh, the little girl that is watching what uh, the adults are doing. Again, these are what is delightful with Brogo is all of these details. Here you have the woman uh, carrying some uh, dry wood, another one, young girl, pulling another one on the sled. And a view on the cliffs and other people there dancing, skating on the pond. And the last one is the gloomy day uh, in February, showing February. Uh, the, everything is, as you know, February can be really dreary. It's, it's dark, it's still windy. People knew and they show here uh, some boats here in peril. Uh, because the, the sea is very agitated. And uh, so they, these are again these details. You have snow on the peaks at the back. They are cutting off the branches of the willows because they're going to use it for all kinds of things. And this is something I remember very well. There are many roads in the north of Belgium where you have these kind of willows and every year they would come and cut all the dead branches and then it would grow back. On the side, we have some figures here. With, it's a couple with a child. And this is uh, telling you uh, what it is. They're going to a festival. And guess what? This is 16th century. If anybody tells you that waffles were invented in the 18th century, they are wrong. This is the proof. The, the man is eating a Belgian waffle to show you how far back it goes. Uh, the child has that kind of a paper crown on his head and the lantern, and this tells you that they're going to, and he's uh, surrounded by two pillows attached around his waist. They're going to the festival of the Epiphany. And the Epiphany is the day uh, to celebrate the, uh, ad the, ad the Magi and the adoration of the Magi. This is a little later because now it's on the 6th of January but uh, it could be that at that time, the Epiphany was on an, another uh, date. And so we know by the hat he's wearing that he's going to the uh, festival of the Epiphany. Here we can see how they are attending to the roofs uh, of the houses where it has been damaged during the winter. Thatch roofs that are repaired. And then again, one of these mag magnificent uh, cityscape, if you can say, of the massacre of the innocent. So again, the tragic moment where Herod is sending all his soldiers to because he's been told that a child that was born then was going to take over the throne of Israel. Uh, he sends his uh, soldiers to all the, the small town around to kill the eldest child of each family. And so this is the massacre of the innocent happening, but in that beautiful setting of a winter village in the north. This, of course, would be something pretty uh, vividly reminded by people around there because we had 
the Spanish occupation at that time. And sometimes when the soldiers were not paid, they would just come and loot uh, villages. So it was familiar, tragically familiar in Flanders at that time. And where in um, Bruegel's mind and surely by, by, for his own safety, he would not condemn uh, the Spanish uh, aggression, but he would deliver kind of more general condemnation of war and the individual acts of atrocity that comes with it. Here, completely different work. We have the sermon of St. John the Baptist and in that crowd of people that we see with really uh, very large uh, figures here, uh, so, you know, set into the kind of blankets. We even have a church in there. We have the figure of John the Baptist here in the middle uh, that is preaching. And he's uh, very much like uh, one of the preachers that you could find at the time of Reformation that would come to villages and really attract the attention of the suffering population. Another unusual, as we see with, with uh, Brogan, it's always unusual. He is the conversion of St. Paul, painted two, two years before his death. Uh, in that, again, extraordinary landscape, you can imagine him walking through the Alps when he, he went down south. Um, it, is, it shows Paul's army on its way to Damascus. He is dressed in a contemporary dress with uh, 16th century armor and weapons. He's here in the back, you don't even see his, his face. And uh, he is dressed in very dark navy blue. And so this is in fact, before we see the, um, the conversion of, no, actually here he's uh, Paul, I apologize. Here is Paul, so he's fallen from his horse, really lost in the crowd. And that's when he has that vision of Christ telling him to that his name would be changed to, to Paul from Saul and that he should convert and fight for him. Again, with often you have with, with Brugel, you have to look for the, the, the central figure of the action. In the census at Bethlehem, we have again the charm of the village, very similar in setting to the children's games. Uh, when we have uh, people that are supposed to go to Bethlehem and not only uh, being um, counted as, as the census does, but also pay a tax. And it's only once you look really well at all that happens that you see a man pulling an ass and an oxen and a woman on the ass. And we realize it is Mary and Joseph, Mary being pregnant on their way to the census. Again, you have all kinds of, of little cameos of children playing, men doing this and that, a frozen pond, a ruined castle on the beach and the setting sun. This one I showed you already with the nativity that's in very unusual adoration of the kings in the snow. Here on the very left of the painting, you can see the Magi uh, in adoration in front of the uh, young, recently born Jesus. But this doesn't seem to be the subject of the painting the subject is that snow falling. And admire the, the, the color, the palette, uh, of uh, Bruegel at the time, they really transmit that sense of cold in that village. More fun and very different is the peasant wedding. A peasant wedding that shows you a completely different side uh, to the uh, peasant's life. The young woman is sitting uh, behind that kind of cloth of honor uh, she's very composed. We're not sure who the uh, groom is. It could be this man, but nobody agrees fully on what it is. And we can see the typical 
uh, food that was uh, offered at that time. We have uh, porridge and soup. Uh, bread would be there. You had wine and uh, water here. A little girl sitting down and eating with her hands. Uh, this is, in fact, stacked hay in the back with uh, some uh, beautiful uh, pieces of uh, corn hanging with a rake holding it. They are uh, playing this kind of uh, bagpipe to accompany the, the group. And then the very strange figure that we see on the side is a nobleman. He's obviously dressed very differently to uh, the, the other company and discussion with the monk. And again, this is these little details that Bruegel presents that what are they talking about? Is the monk talking about the beautiful weddings that he's already performed at the nobleman's house? It's, you can guess, it's your, your idea. This, by the way, as you can see, it's a door that they have taken off the hinges and they're carrying around and use as a large tray to distribute the food. Uh, Bruegel is often called Peasant Bruegel because of his wonderful description of uh, peasants. Uh, this is that uh, peasant dance and it shows the time when the peasants that are such hard workers uh, that the, all the city depends on their work for their survival because they're the ones that are growing the, the wheat and other cereals. Uh, that are uh, attending the, the flocks and, and providing the meat. And when they had a particular um, festival, typically religious festival, that's why you have the little church there at the end, uh, they, that's the way they could uh, enjoy themselves. And then they would go all out, they would dance, you have the, the backpiper here at the front. You have the little girls dancing together. You have some people drinking and eating too much probably, uh, but this gives you, it almost, you can hear almost the music and the steps on the ground uh, from uh, these uh, people. As you can see too, he is showing people without uh, idealizing them. They, these are shown in their rough condition, where, uh, whereas most of other painters, when they were showing the high society, would always try to embellish them. This is also a change in his work where he's showing now sometimes some large figures, and this would be uh, literally a the result of his visit to Italy. The wedding dance in the open air is another of his beautiful um, peasant uh, representation. Uh, you have, you difficult to know where the bride is because she would not be dressed in white as we see now. What we see is people having a lot of fun, kissing, drinking, dancing. What we see at the back here is that kind of class of honor with the, the headdress of the, the uh, bride. And then in front of it is a little table where people can come and then uh, drop money so that the, the young couple can start on the right foot. They all see also another detail is they're digging up uh, a long patch here so that people uh, around the, uh, long what is going to become a table. And so people can sit there and eat when they finish dancing. The land of cocaine, uh, land of cocaine, this is a term that was cocaine in French and different words in uh, German, is that idea since the 12th century uh, of the, the, the land of plenty where you have everything that you want. And it is true that in the North, they, they were blessed, they had a lot of food, but it also talks about the foolishness of, of men. And here we have that knight half dressed that is waiting there with the mouth open for one of these to fall into his mouth. You have cooked chicken, you have 
uh, all kind of uh, different fantasy. This is probably one of the most stunning painting that he did. This is, by the way, not on the board, but on the linen canvas. And you can see the canvas coming through the paint because it has been uh, with the time. I mean, this is uh, 500 years old. And um, the, the painting had unfortunately flaked off. But you see that series of the blind leading the blind uh, this is uh, comes from a, a biblical parable from the Gospel of Matthew. Let them alone, they'll be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall in the ditch. And this is what you observe, is actually they all, depending on one another, but because they attach to one another, once the first falls, they go on and they all, and you can see them progressively falling forward and they're all going to end up in that ditch. Uh, it has been studied by uh, the medical profession and they found that uh, they represent actually all very different type of blindness. Uh, so you have uh, corneal leucoma, atrophy of the globe and removed eyes. Uh, the removed eyes uh, would uh, come back from, it, it was a punishment for somebody who uh, had uh, sinned, if you want, in, in a certain way. In the back is a little church that is uh, known. It's called St. Anna Church in the village of St. Anna Pede. It's marvelously uh, observed and even the, the, the way the, the clothes are floating around, the, the handling of the head is absolutely stunning. And you can see that the first of the, the series was uh, playing the hurdy-gurdy. In the same uh, idea, we have here the, the cripples and it's a, a small, very small painting. It's 18 by 21 centimeters that shows a lie goes like a cripple on crutches um, with the idea that uh, society is so hypocritical. Uh, so what we, we find is that the cripples seem to be very excited uh, and we don't know why. We know that a woman is leaving with an empty dish. So she probably came and fed them. They all dressed with different hat that has all significance. This would represent um, the headdress of a bishop. This would be a fur hat, so that would be for a bourgeois or an aristocrat. He is a cap that would be for a soldier. This is a crown for a, a king. Uh, and this one is difficult to, to um, identify, could be a soldier. And they probably are all on their way to a festival also, and maybe that's why they are so excited. They have also these fur, these fox tails on the back of the, the uh, tunic that he's wearing. And as we've seen in the other painting, the cripples were part of an everyday life in the villages. And so here it's... Uh, uh, we don't know if this is a carnival costume or if it has any other significance. Toward the end of his life, he likes, uh, Brogel is going to uh, privilege some larger figures too in, in the peasant and the bird nester. Uh, he is actually illustrating, he who knows where the nest is has the knowledge, he who rubs it has the nest. And that was really interesting, though he shows that very calm figure of what seems to be a fisherman uh, that is walking and by keeping his head up, he doesn't realize he's going to fall into the brook in front of him. But he is pointing up at the, the young boy who is going up to uh, try to get some eggs from the nest and in the meantime he's losing his hat.
in the misanthrope, uh, he is uh, representing because the world is perfidious, I'm going into mourning, showing that figure who's trying to escape all the negative side of life. Uh, but in the painting, they're trying to show him that in fact, it is impossible. You cannot escape. You have to face reality. He doesn't even realize that that young boy that is kind of encased in the in the glass globe, he it's cutting the purse that he's carrying, and so you have there the consequences of life, the natural side of life uh, that you cannot escape. And on the other hand, in the back you have a shepherd attending his sheep in the very quiet and and uh, very virtuous way. These are the love for um, these proverbs. It's going to go on in the 17th century and used by many uh, artists to identify some of the weaknesses of men. And an interesting one here is magpie on the gallow. So we have in front of us that a big gallow, fortunately, with nobody hanging, and the cross down below, which shows that probably somebody was buried there. A magnificent landscape, so fine, so crisp. And then two proverbs probably shown here. Uh, magpie, um, so the to shit at the gallow, sorry for using that term, but it's the way. If you look well on the left here is a man defecating in the corner. And this would uh, be uh, identifying uh, the fact that uh, somebody is not concerned about death and the authorities. Now, on the other side, we have people dancing, dancing under the gallows. That means that uh, either you don't see the danger or you're not afraid of it. So again, two illustration in one painting of two proverbs. And But the excuse is extraordinary because the landscape is so attractive behind. And then an unfinished painting. This is painted in 60, 1568, um, unfinished. It shows the storm at sea. This is uh, one of Brogel's last painting. And we don't have really an idea of uh, the interpretation. We see some ships threatened by the storm. Uh, shows that man is not master of nature. Uh, on the other hand, we see that the sailors have poured some uh, oil onto the water to calm the sea. And of course, that does not going to do anything. And they sacrificed the barrel that you see here from the cargo to distract the mighty whale, which is coming here. You see the tail of the whale and the, the, the mouth open. Probably unfinished because he was sick or he died. And I'm going to conclude with uh, this uh, drawing pen and black ink on a brown paper of the painter and the buyer, because I think it's also quite a bit the, the spirit of Bruegel, who was his own man, he was painting, you can see it's not him, but it represents that kind of a little bit odd figure with a hair, disheveled uh, head of hair. Uh, he is in the process of painting, so we know the painting is not finished. But then behind him is that figure with little spectacles and very thin lips of the guy who is looking at the painting. It doesn't seem to realize that it's not quite finished. And so uh, often it's showing the, sometimes the, the naivety of the, the connoisseur, the so-called connoisseur and the buyer who doesn't quite realize what the painter knows. And we'll, we'll see at the end of this series of uh, the Renaissance, so towards May, uh, we'll do a whole uh, program on the collections of the time. So I hope you have discovered uh, in Aldorfer, or even to start with, um, with Dürer, Aldorfer, and now Brogel, that series of painters who became very attached to nature and so next time we're going to look something very different, the court portraits, particularly with Holbein and the Clouet family. So let me stop the recording.